Toronto as well. So um, I say we start. So just as a brief introduction, um, so um, a review of the agenda of tonight. We're actually very fortunate and lucky to have um, a member from the federal Canadian government who works very closely and is a huge thought leader on digital identity that is going to be giving an update to us uh, at the start of the meeting today. And so uh, we just found that out a few hours ago and we're excited to hear from Tim Bauma. Um, once Tim gives his update, then we'll hand the floor or the video conference virtual floor over to Drummond Reed. And Drummond, thanks again for doing this. Uh, quite excited to uh, have you participate and very, very much looking forward to hearing your presentation and all these use cases that you've curated here for this presentation, which we see here below. So passwordless login, customer onboarding, credential-based auth, supply chain provenance and origins, and compliance. And so what we're going to do, I, th I think Drummond had mentioned when he starts, as he's covering the five groups of use cases, um, as, as the presentation is going, please feel free to use the chat on our meeting invite to post any questions. Drummond will do his best to uh, follow the questions. And if they are relevant to what he's talking about, we'll do his best to try to address them. And anything left over, uh, Drummond will try to address them towards the end of the call. Um, if we run out of time, which uh, seems to happen a lot when talking about SSI, because there's uh, endless amount of things to talk about, we'll do our best to connect anyone or just answer these questions following the meeting. Um, if anyone wants to tweet uh, about this event or uh, talk about it on social media, feel free to use the hashtag SSI Toronto. Uh, it would be much appreciated. We're uh, just in the beginning of our SSI journey, but one of the most important things we felt like we needed to do early on is really build a community around this. Um, Self-sovereign identity and a lot of distributed technologies only work when people are cooperating and collaborating together. So uh, we really think that this is something important that needs to be done, and we are working our hardest to bring the whole community together to ensure that uh, Canada stays uh, a leader in the space and helps accelerate this on a global scale. And so uh, without further ado, I will uh, give the digital floor to Tim Bauma. Um, Tim, I added a bit of your details on here. I quite yeah, enjoy listening to your podcast uh, <laughs> as well. So I would, uh, I, I would say anyone that's interested uh, beyond this meeting, Tim is curating tons of fantastic content that could be found on SoundCloud and on uh, the Apple's podcast store and I'm sure many other stores. So uh, please uh, go check that out afterwards and support Tim. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, an amazing advocate we have in the space here and uh, happy to have you on the call today, Tim. So I'll, uh, I'll shoot the floor to you and I, I believe you wanted to share a screen. Yeah, that'd be great. So, so thanks so much for uh, having me. This just came together at the last minute. So I'll qualify that my presentation is completely unrehearsed and, uh, but I have a lot of good material to share. So uh, I just want to make sure that I can, um, just making sure that I can share my screen here. I, I, I'm just going to be sharing some of the figures that we have in our Pan Canadian Trust Framework document and uh, just to give you a, a visual of things that you can look at. Can, can you actually see the uh, uh, slide right now? Yeah, we could see it, Tim. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and it's 608. I promise to keep my remarks to 10 minutes or less, but um, I, I'm pretty excited because we're, we just put the finishing touches on the use case chapter for the self-sovereign identity book that uh, Drummond will be talking a little bit later. And the, the title of the, 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 the chapter is Canada Enabling Self-Sovereign Identity. And it's quite substantive. We've got about uh, 10 or 12 pages of content here. And I'll just kind of walk you through uh, some of the things that we've been going through in the Canadian public sector and just relating it back to this product that you're seeing on the screen, the, 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 the PCTF model. Um, so, you know, uh, where, where do I start here? We, we've been looking at uh, self-sovereign identity. We've been looking at it for a long time in, in terms of what the, what the technologies are, what the model is. 
And, you know, things are still evolving. Like in, in the early days of identity management, we had more of a program centric point of view, but we've shifted it to a user centric uh, point of view. And now we're moving to like a self sovereign point of view. And we've learned a lot over the years, if not the decades to come up with a policy approach or a pan Canadian approach that doesn't necessarily uh, lock us in to any particular technology. And in fact, when we started in earnest on the pan Canadian trust framework, self sovereign identity wasn't even, um, a term that uh, existed yet. It might have existed in certain quarters, but it was certainly something that uh, we weren't uh, aware of. But we be started to become familiar with it, uh, with the concepts, and really followed closely with uh, what uh, Drummond has been doing and the self-sovereign community, and actively ingesting those concepts into the, the, the pan-Canadian pan trust framework. The, the other thing that we've actually taken a lot of attention to is that because we're the public sector, we have a lot of these legacy systems, the centralized systems, the federated systems, they're not gonna go away anytime soon. And we actually have to come up with an approach that actually synthesizes that together so those systems can actually uh, uh, come, come together. And this is where we're at, like uh, with what we've, what we've been calling the, the public sector profile of the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework. It's really a model of agreed on concepts, uh, definitions of processes, conformance criteria, and, and an equal part to it is an assessment approach that enables us to do uh, a detailed assessment of uh, other jurisdictions. It could be other sectors. So we can actually ex accept, accept trusted digital identities. That's the other thing that's happened behind the scenes, so to speak, is that actively uh, with the government of Canada, over the past 10 years, uh, I guess it was 2009, we introduced our first policy instrument, the Directive on Identity Management. And uh, we revised that in 2019, 10 years later, and we, we added some new concepts like trust, uh, uh, trusted digital identity and trust frameworks that really have set us up to actually accept uh, uh, self-sovereign identity or trusted digital identity. And so we've been taking those ideas and making sure it actually fits within to the policy framework um, that we've been developing so we can actually be ready for the future and not be locked in, into, the fa into the past. And it is proving itself out. You may not be aware, um, as of February 10th, we have, have the province of BC integrated into the federal programs. It's within Canada Revenue Agency. We also have Alberta that's integrated into the My Service Canada account. We're accepting the trusted digital identities. It's traditional legacy integrations that I talked about earlier but uh, we're setting the stage for enabling uh, digital wallets and the notion of self-sovereign identity so an individual can present their, present their trusted digital identity that we can consume at, uh, uh, as, a federal, as a federal government. So, you know, we've been conceptualizing so we can actually fit this together. The, the, the block diagram here, and we, I, I can point you to that we have this all up on GitHub and so you can read, we have, have all the formal definitions and that, but just to go through what we're calling the normative core of the model is that we formally define what we call identity domains, foundational identity and contextual identity. We formalize this notion of digital representations, identity of individuals and um, organizations, businesses. We're looking at relationships. We defined a whole bunch of processes, which are atomic processes. That's really the detailed enable us to do the conformity assessments. Uh, assess, uh, assessments and then dependencies on other organizations or other jurisdictions and that can be applied against what we call the conformance criteria and qualifiers. It's really a conformity assessment framework but now we have the ability to do the due diligence to accept a, a province as an issuer of claims if you will to use some of the um, the lingo and self-sovereign identity and, and quite frankly digital identity or trusted digital identity is just a very specific use case of the more broader case of verifiable credentials and self-sovereign identity. The other, the other part is that we have the mutual recognition process, which we go through to actually uh, going from the bottom to the top, mapping the processes, aligning it to other frameworks. We're starting to have conversations with EIDAS and what we call the digital nations, other countries, so we can actually start mutual recognition, have a formal assessment and acceptance process. At the bottom part, you'll see this notion of digital ecosystem roles and supporting infrastructure. We, we know that this, this has to work with existing investments and existing infrastructure, and also has to fit into like institutional frameworks. And so we've spent a lot of effort, I'm going to the next slide, of formally defining, if you're familiar with the W3C uh, model of verifiable credentials and self-sovereign identity, 
you're probably familiar with issuer, holder, and verifier. We've uh, really mapped that out to the notion of subject and claims. And then we've added another box on the bottom, which we're calling methods. Uh, what we've learned is that uh, you need to trust a, um, a system, if you will, that's more than just a single organization. It's more than a blockchain. It's more than a database. It's a set of methods where you can register and confirm, but also make sure that everything is correct and nothing has been changed. And I just wanted to show that. So we found that we can actually take this model and we can map like um, authoritative parties, relying parties, service providers. We do have a mapping in the, uh, the, the trust framework. I'm just, I have four minutes left. I'm just being very mindful of um, the time here. The, the other thing that we've uh, learned as well is that we're making a clear separation between what I would call, what we've been calling the conveyance networks, those things that actually convey the proofs versus those that issue and, and verify the proofs. So we now are starting to see a very clean separation of um, now we know where the infrastructure players can fit in. And it doesn't really matter whether it's centralized, federated or blockchain or completely decentralized. We know how to box those things in, in the middle, if you will, to actually convey the proofs. Where our primary concern is making sure that whatever gets issued onto that network, we actually trust in the first place. And then when it gets verified, it hasn't changed since. So we have a nice uh, clear separation now. We've also just been working with Drummond to make sure that we're mapping with uh, the notion of the trust over IP stack, the four layers. And this is where we've uh, mapped like the, the model of the PCTF, the normative core, the mutual recognition, really sits at the layer of uh, governance frameworks. It's not a formal governance framework uh, per se, um, when you put it into the larger picture of legislation and regulation, and formal agreements between jurisdictions it kind of fits a little bit below there, but but it, it actually fits in very nicely there. The the layer three, the credential exchange, basically that's the digital ecosystem roles, and I, Drum, Drummond will be talking about a little bit later. And then the whole thing about DIDCOM and DID registries really fits into the notion of supporting infrastructure. And a, again, not with not directly within the scope of the PCTF. Um, but we see the huge potential of these emerging technologies, but we also see that we actually have to support traditional like SAML integration, open ID connections, uh, open ID connect. So we're, we're just making sure that we can actually um, migrate to the new platforms without like burning the old platforms down. Uh, supporting infrastructure. I think this is the last slide here. We know that this has to fit into a larger context of making sure we meet our digital service delivery requirements, user needs, so on and so forth. Um, we're not reinventing uh, privacy and security. We already have a privacy impact assessment, so security assessment authorization, and also interoperability standards. We know that there's a bunch of interoperability standards out there. We're not redefining those things. We're actually leveraging that. And again, coming back to the province of BC doing the, 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 the assessment process, the, that was only one of eight work streams that were involved in, 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 in actually onboarding the province. There was also uh, communications, there was agreements, there was a privacy impact assessment, the technical integration, the security assessment, uh, there was an overall governance uh, uh, stream. But uh, this just shows how everything fits together. Um, so I, I know it's, it's a bit of a mile of a minute here, but um, I think, it, you know, coming back to the chapter that we had written, I'll, I'll I'll just read some of the statements that we came up. We said trust frameworks such as PCTF and self-sovereign identity are parts of a larger global picture. Uh, domestically and internationally, there is a new and emerging global ecosystem incorporating a mixture of new technologies and legacy systems. And it is anticipated that these technologies and approaches will coexist for the foreseeable future. Um, as, as, I, as I said, we, we have assessed and accepted uh, from the province of Alberta and the province of BC. Uh, there were traditional integration methods, but we certainly see uh, how we could actually integrate what's called like the Alberta Credential Ecosystem and also the British Columbia Verifiable Organization, a Verifiable Organizations Network. And there's some other stuff that BC is doing as well in Ontario and uh, globally as well. So really, you know, we're actively pursuing SSI. It's still too early to predict the future. That's one thing that we've learned. We've got to keep our options open as much as possible. And the PCTF, which you saw here, is really a tool to help relate SSI into the government context and to drive like what's really hard is the institutional change to better serve Canadians. Really the hard part is dealing with all the legal folks and the policy folks and um, 
it, you don't see that on the surface, but that's where a lot of the hard work is. And really we see this actually encouraging like new institutional relationships that can leverage self-sovereign identity. And if we do it right, it's going to become pervasive and it's just gonna create a better digital ecosystem. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I was one minute over and I will hand it over, hand the screen Thank over you, Tim. and away we go. Thank you, Tim. Um, much appreciated. Uh, where, where could folks find you or find out about the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework? Yep. Uh, what, what we could do, if you look on my Twitter account, I actually have a pinned tweet uh, that will bring you to the GitHub repo. That's probably the best way to uh, uh, find it. And uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, quite happy to point you to the stuff. I'm trying to uh, le lever like blogs and uh, GitHub and um, uh, my podcast. So if, if, you, if you go to that, you'll find some pinned tweets on or, or you'll send tweets on my uh, my, I think it's on my profile where you can get with Apple and Google and so on and so forth. So lots of info and feel free to reach out to me if there's anything that specific that you need. Wonderful. Thank you very much. You're Thanks, welcome. Tim. Um, all right. So um, very excited now for this next presentation uh, by Drum and Reed. So, um, as we've been going deeper and deeper into self-sovereign identity and trying to see the different different benefits and value propositions of this, there's just an explosion of possible use cases and different things that we could do. So one of the toughest things with any new technology or opportunity is just having focus and focusing on real world problems that could be solved and things that could be solved, I guess, in the short term and other things in the long term. And so... Um, we wanted to explore what's possible, and we couldn't think of anyone better than Drummond Reed, the Chief Trust Officer at Evernim. Um, Drummond has been in the digital identity space for it's like quite a while, Drummond. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're very fortunate to, to have Drummond here today, and hope, hopefully everyone that really enjoys and gets value out of this presentation. Um, and just a r reminder again, if, if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation, please, write the questions on the chat within the Zoom link, and Drummond will try to address them as uh, he's going through. So thank you. I'll uh, give the digital floor to you, Drummond. Uh, thanks very much, Matthew. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, speak with everyone and to, and to have uh, Tim join us. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his work and, 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 and the, the PCTF and the most recent version and, and all the work that he's done to uh, uh, make it uh, both backwards and forwards compatible with, uh, with what we're gonna be talking about today, um, um, SSI. Um, you'll see a number of the, uh, of the uh, use case examples I'm gonna bring up here uh, reflect uh, Canada because of its leadership in, um, in digital identity. And it, they just keep doing it. I don't know what's in the water up there, but uh, it's, it's fantastic. So um, yeah, let's dive into it. Uh, this, uh, I, I'm not gonna talk as, as much about architecture as I normally do here. I will cover the basics, but I really, we we're gonna talk use cases and real, uh, real problems that SSI is uh, already being put to work to solve. So yeah, a little bit of my background. I have, uh, as Matthew said, done, been doing this for over 20 years now. Uh, I've been to all 29 instances of the Internet Identity Workshop. Uh, sounds like number 30 might be virtual. It's uh, in, at the end of April, so we'll see about that one. I've been working on all kinds of identity standards. And in particular now, uh, I've been working on uh, uh, was, was involved with verifiable credentials, but I'm one of the editors of the DID spec, the, the, the uh, decentralized identifiers. That's the other uh, key specification that's uh, uh, at the heart of what we're doing with self-sovereign identity. Um, and uh, my day job is chief trust officer at Evernim, but uh, uh, my night job is a trustee at the Sovereign Foundation where I chair the governance framework working group. And that's why we particularly appreciate the work of Tim and everyone on the uh, Pan-Canadian Trust Framework because it is one of the leading trust frameworks in the world uh, and an inspiration for our work as well. Um, and, and I did a lot of work uh, uh, with the uh, US government on the early uh, uh, standards, I always like to call out that they helped uh, uh, fund both the early work on the DID standard and then on decentralized key management. Um, so uh, a number of governments are helping us uh, move this all forward. So uh, just to make it clear for everyone, so Evernim, you know, we're a commercial uh, a vendor. 
SSI software solutions um, and uh, based on Sovereign and other Hyperledger Indie networks. Um, Evernim contributed the original code uh, and, and helped uh, start up the Sovereign Foundation, but it is a completely independent international nonprofit uh, whose whole goal is uh, helping establish self-sovereign identity infrastructure that can be relied on by everyone everywhere. Uh, identity for all is, is our model there. And Sovereign in turn contributed uh, the code to Hyperledger, um, where it originally became the Indie project, and, and then uh, the crypto libraries were spun off into uh, the Hyperledger URSA project, URSA. Uh, highly recommended if you're into the crypto uh, uh, part of it. And, and then uh, uh, a third project was spun off called Hyperledger Ares for the uh, uh, agent and wallet code um, that is ledger independent. And uh, um, so if, if I make references to the Hyperledger projects, it refers to all those. So uh, what, what uh, Matthew and everyone wanted to cover here today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure anyone that's new to the general concept, we have a basic understanding together of verifiable credentials and, and the special governance frameworks. And then we're just going to talk about five major real market use cases. And I'm gonna explain the use case in each case and then provide a, a very specific example. And uh, what, what I like about uh, this and preparing this presentation is there are multiple examples in the real world out there. Not all of them are, are Evernim customers, uh, uh, but, but um, there are you know, not just like solitary examples. And so I, I you know, selected ones I thought were um, you know, the most illustrative that I could easily uh, talk about. Uh, some of them, I just came from the Hyperledger Global Forum event in Phoenix last week and wanted to highlight uh, the last one I'll be talking about a presentation that was given there. So it's uh, sort of the uh, cutting edge news. But, um, but I will mention other examples of each of these five. And the second thing I wanna say is there are probably at least five more uh, uh, buckets of use cases I could have chosen, but that would have taken too long. So I, I tried to pick the ones that represent the most real uh, you know, pain points in the market that we are seeing today. So let's dive right into it um, and start out with just some slides uh, that I think many of you, if, if you've seen any of my work before, you've seen these slides where we make sure that the overall metaphor of what we're doing with SSI, uh, verifiable credentials is, I like to you know, hold out a wallet and say, we've been doing this for quite a while, we just haven't been doing it digitally. Um, and as credentials are moving on to uh, devices like our smartphones, we are using wallets, we are using uh, things like mobile boarding passes or mobile movie tickets uh, regularly. Um, that's a step in the right direction, but those are proprietary. And what we need to do is move to open standard digital wallets and digital credentials. And that's the work that's been going on at W3C. So this diagram is actually taken from the W3C verifiable credential uh, data model 1.0 specification, which became a full W3C uh, standard last November. Um, so it's been all the way through several years of the standardization process. And, uh, and this, this trust triangle is, is how all uh, verifiable digital credentials work. They all have issuers um, that uh, either, you know, you can think if you're, if you're a physical wallet, someone issued you a credential that you hold in that wallet and you go present to a verifier such as a uh, passport or a driving license when you wanna go get on a plane. Um, the role here in the center uh, of what's called the verifiable data registry is actually quite critical from a cryptographic standpoint, and I'll explain that a little bit more, just, just the high level in this, by moving to this next diagram. And again, I want to explain just enough of, the, of, of how verifiable credentials work so that as we go through the five major use cases, you can see exactly where the technology is providing the breakthrough value. Um, so, so this is you know, a little simplified geometric version of the, of the um, trust triangle. And uh, I want to make sure it's clear, what is the role of blockchain? Why, why is it uh, a breakthrough in allowing us to move to verifiable credentials? And uh, the answer is it provides us a decentralized way to, uh, to, to publish and verify the public keys and other metadata we need 
so that uh, we, can, we can digitally sign credentials in a way they can be verified. And to do that, the issuer of the credential is the party that needs to uh, write what we call a decentralized identifier and the associated material, including the public key, to um, a blockchain designed for that. Uh, there are did methods are called for many different blockchains. There are over 40 did methods that have been created so far. And, uh, and they can work with any blockchain. There are several with, that work with Bitcoin. There are, I think, nine now that have been written for Ethereum. Um, and then for other uh, uh, SSI-specific blockchains like Sovereign or Veris One. So the issuer takes that step to prepare itself. At that point, it began, can begin issuing credentials, uh, verifiable credentials, in the W3 standard format. And what they're able to do is sign them with the private key corresponding to the public key with the DID on the blockchain. That DID of the issuer is in the credential so that when it goes to the holder and into their wallet, the holder is now able to produce uh, a proof of that credential. And we call them proofs because it's not the same thing as just getting a credential out of your wallet and showing it to, uh, to someone in, uh, in real life because the digital credential with zero knowledge cryptography specifically, you can just prove what the verifier needs to know. If you're entering a bar, you can prove you're just old enough to drink. You don't have to reveal everything on a driver's license or a passport. Um, so <clears throat> that's the proof stage. Now, when the verifier gets the proof, again, it has the DID um, of the issuer. So what it's able to do is read from the blockchain, read that uh, did document, uh, get the public key, and then verify the proof. And we'll have uh, a cryptographic certainty that, in fact, that credential and, and whatever was needed to be in the proof was issued by that issuer. Um, <clears throat> which gets me to the final two points. A credential only has value to a verifier if it comes from an issuer that they trust. Um, so you, you need to have, there needs to be a trust relationship of some kind, but what there doesn't need to be is any form of integration between that verifier and issuer. This is what is so dramatically different about um, SSI infrastructure versus um, federated or centralized identity systems where every verifier has to be integrated with either um, a centralized system or with a, a, an identity provider within a feder uh, federated system. So this is why we believe that uh, verifiable credentials uh, are, you know, they are a breakthrough, they are uh, a paradigm shift in how we can do highly scalable uh, and very flexible digital identity. So this is the, <clears throat> the basic model. I wanna point out just two other things before we dive into the use cases. And uh, first one is to clarify that uh, under this model, although there are multiple ways of doing it, what we're doing uh, in all the Hyperledger um, architecture is ensuring that all the private information that pertains to a particular um, a holder of, 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 of verifiable credentials stays off chain, stays in, uh, privately in their own wallet. And so uh, you notice that there was a DID for the issuer. We do not require the holder to have a DID on the blockchain because the holder is able, when it forms a relationship with the issuer, when it first um, needs a credential, for example, they will exchange uh, what we call pairwise peer dids. And these are dids that are produced directly in the wallets of the, uh, of the, of the two parties, exchanged together with their did documents, and then kept in uh, synchronization as either one of them needs to rotate keys. So this becomes a private pairwise connection uh, and channel for uh, communications just between these two parties. Uh, when the holder, for instance, first goes to a verifier who is requesting a proof, the same thing happens there. Uh, by default, it's another pairwise uh, uh, peer-did relationship. And what we're building up is a graph of all of our relationships, but each uh, holder in the center of those is, is, is a, a peer with uh, all the others, and these DIDs and, and uh, public and private keys stay entirely private. Uh, you'll never need to uh, share those outside of that relationship, which means it's uh, almost trivially easy now to authenticate and have a secure and private channel uh, as you're sharing verifiable credentials or doing anything else with these relationships. <clears throat> so um, the, I'm going to make one more point, and then we'll take any questions about this section before we dive into the use cases. And that is the special role of governance frameworks. 
So uh, in many cases, it, it's asked, okay, so if providers have to know, uh, you know, have to be able to trust uh, uh, issuers, um, uh, and this is an example of, of, of uh, from, for instance, uh, healthcare, where you've got um, a, a hospital uh, that might need to know, okay, can I accept uh, a proof of coverage from uh, 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 some insurance company? Well, can they know all the insurance companies that uh, that that that's um, you know that they need to <clears throat> be able to access if it's a very large network? And so the answer you, you, you get to there is you add a second trust triangle. And uh, we call it the governance uh, trust triangle because um, you're adding, again, uh, another party called the governance authority. And this shows one example of how uh, a governance authority could turn around and authorize a set of issuers to be to, you know, under uh, what we call a governance framework, a document that they publish. Now, of course, the governance authority can be a government. And uh, so you can see how the Pan-Canadian uh, uh, Trust Framework fit, f it fits wonderfully within this model. And uh, in that case, the different uh, provinces, for example, would all be the issuers. Now, they don't necessarily have to issue uh, a verifiable credential to each province. There are many other ways that um, um, they could uh, authorize a, a particular set of issuers. Uh, they can publish a DID list directly, even in the Pan-Canadian uh, Trust Framework or another mechanism, a white list, but they could also issue verifiable credentials. And now a verifier for, receives a proof from some uh, holder um, from an issuer that it doesn't know directly, it can make a second request uh, of, of that issuer. Can you show a uh, credential that you're part of a governance framework that it trusts? And if you want an example, well, how does that scale? Um, the largest trust networks in the world work exactly this way. If we took the example of MasterCard, for instance, it's a governance authority over the whole MasterCard network. It authorizes every bank that can issue MasterCards to what they call cardholders, which put them in their wallet. And then they go and use it at a merchant to prove that they're authorized to, to buy goods there. So uh, what we've done with SSI infrastructure is we've generalized this so it can be used for any trust network of any kind of information at any scale anywhere, um, all done according to open standards. So, um, so that I'm gonna stop there before we dive into the use cases and check and see if we have any questions. To do that, I actually have to um, pop into uh, or, or open up the, uh, the chat window, which I see keeps coming up, but I'm on a single screen. So give me a second to see if I can get that. I'm gonna pop out of full screen mode just for a second to check the chat. Oops, hang on. I'm going to, yeah, there's there's several things in there. Okay, give me just a second to go back to share and bring that back up and get the chat open in that mode. There we go. Yeah. Hey, Drum, this is Daryl. I think most of the questions have been answered already in line. Okay, excellent. I appreciate that. I just wanted to uh, make sure if anything was uh, was coming up that we I was able to take it. So um, I'll go back to uh, full share here. Actually, I'll pop on to the next slide here. Thanks, Daryl. Um, I now have the uh, chat window open where I can see it. When you go into full screen present mode, it gets rid of it uh, and, until you manually bring it back. So I will keep an eye on that. And uh, Daryl, please continue, uh, feel free to continue answering questions, uh, given that he is an expert in these, in these topics. Okay, and we'll stop at, at each of these uh, uh, five. Uh, I'll go through the use case and, uh, and the example, and then uh, any questions that come up, let's just dive into them one by one. All right, so we'll, uh, the first one, uh, passwordless login, or, and also widely referred to cross silo authentication. Now, all of us have, you know, we're all part of, of, of different systems or, or we're, we're accessing different systems where, where we as users have this problem. We need to prove who we are across multiple trust domains. And ideally, both we and the parties we're dealing with would like us to be able to do that without joining a federation or signing up with a particular third party identity provider. 
Now, the self-sovereign identity solution to that is is one of the most you know, sort of basic things uh, you can do with uh, a digital wallet and verifiable credentials. Um, any one of those parties that uh, will, can accept either a single credential designed for that purpose or any one of a family of credentials, it can be used for passwords authentication at any verifier um, that, that will trust uh, those credentials. Again, what you're proving is, hey, I'm coming back with uh, the same credential I used before, which of course is what we're doing with usernames and passwords. But because of the underlying cryptography, we're able to do it now without any username or password at all. And uh, as I'm highlighting here, uh, the verifier can do it on the basis of any credential you have in your wallet, uh, which is why I think certain credentials that I'll mention coming up here have, have a chance for very broad um, uh, adoption. Now, if you haven't seen this before, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's a, it's a, almost trivially easy process. And I'm gonna show you uh, um, the three screens that you'll see. And, and, and this has been demonstrated time after time at different conferences. Uh, the last time uh, I saw it uh, was at the uh, um, Identity North conference in Vancouver in January. Um, step one, once you have the digital wallet is you scan a QR code wherever it is that you need to log in. Uh, and it, it, can, it, it can be, uh, you know, uh, on your computer screen, on a tablet, uh, any place like that. Um, the QR code contains the information to wake up your wallet and ask you, are you trying to uh, authenticate to that uh, uh, particular provider? And uh, should you ever accidentally scan something where you're not, you're always gonna be asked and you would say not, but if so, you would uh, click through. Um, it will frequently, uh, the security policy may require you to enter a biometric to make sure it's really you and you're in. There is no username or password, not only not visible, but there's nothing to fish. Um, uh, and and th this wonderful quality of two-way authentication, you know who it is that's asking you, um, is also built into it. So <clears throat> the real world example I give you is no, nothing more than uh, something uh, that uh, uh, is, is being designed to help implement uh, the, the Pan-Canadian uh, Trust Framework. Um, as I understand it from the folks in uh, BC, they're calling it the Canadian Identity Kit. And uh, I saw, again, a demonstration at Identity North. Um, it is uh, a, a full suite of open source uh, software based on Hyperledger um, Ares. Um, that uh, the goal is any Canadian citizen in any province would be able to be issued um, a provincial identity such as the one based currently in BC on the services card and then be able to use that for password authentication at any government agency, um, not just within their own province, but also with uh, the federal government. Now, someone like Tim could go uh, much more deeply into uh, the, the whole of that, but I think that's a, uh, uh, you know, one of the broadest uses we've, we're gonna see of, 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 or examples of this kind of use case. And the other place where I think it's, uh, where you'll see it is, is just sort of a built-in feature. Tim also mentioned the Alberta Credential Ecosystem, um, and that has its own website I'm listing here at the bottom of the page. So I will stop and take a breath and a drink of water there and see what, uh, if we have any questions. All right, I'm looking here. Um, <clears throat> there's a question. So what is published to the chain confirms that the credential is valid and only, and is only accessible if the verifier has the proof to hand. So. Uh, yes, I believe the answer to your question is yes. What's published to the chain is the information that the verifier needs. Uh, it's, it's the public key and uh, the, the schema of the credential and what's called the credential definition so that the, verif the software the verifier is running can, can look up the uh, valid public key that corresponds to that DID and then use that to verify the proof that they were given by the holder. And uh, now, so think of it as there's two steps. There's verifying that the, 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 the proof is correct. Uh, it's, it's, digi it's cryptographically valid, which means uh, the public key um, uh, was used to verify it and the cryptography checks and, and therefore the information they asked for, they can 
is is valid and it came from that issuer. It means it came from that issuer. It was not uh, has not been uh, tampered with. And uh, there's a separate. I didn't talk about revocation, but if a credential is revocable, that's also information that uh, the 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 verifier uh, checks with the ledger in order to confirm um, a, a proof uh, about revocation. So um, once it's verified those things, if the, if the verification is passed, it's still up to the verifier to decide um, if the information that it was given is something that it's going to rely on. If it's asked for a proof of age and it said, I just need to know you're over 18, and it says yes, then that's the basis for their decision. But the decision can be much more complex. For instance, qualifying for a loan, uh, may, they may ask for a set of factors and then go through their own, own business processes to decide if, uh, if, if you qualify. Um, okay, Daryl's already helped with an answer there. And the next question from, uh, from John, uh, does it have to be a published DID method? I think the short answer there, John, is that um, if it's not a published DID method, I mean, technically no, but if the um, verifier, if the agent being operated by the verifier does not recognize the DID method, they will not be able to uh, verify the credential. So um, I think that that uh, mitigates very much in favor of widely known and supported DID methods. Uh, I, I personally believe there's gonna be a classic long tail or, or power law curve of, a relatively small set of very widely supported DID methods and then a longer tail of other DID methods that are, are, are being used for more specialized credentials or in specific communities. All right, uh, again, feel free at any point as I go through this to add your questions to the chat and we'll move on to the second use case. I'm keep, keeping an eye on the time here. So uh, this is another classic pain point, customer onboarding. Uh, we all know, you know what, what it's like to have to go fill out forms with, of course, entirely self-asserted data because there's no other option uh, on the web today uh, in order to be onboarded as a new customer. Um, and of course, we do this online. We also do it offline. Uh, one of the big pain points uh, that uh, uh, you know, Evernim has customers dealing with directly right now is in healthcare. Uh, every time you, you visit a doctor, you're often uh, asked to, you know, fill out forms unless you just did it the day before, and sometimes even then. And, of course, all that data um, needs, if the, the merchant needs to independently, uh, merchant or whoever the service provider needs to independently verify. Well, with self-sovereign identity, um, the whole point is you have the information and you have it in a verified form from an issuer. So provided you have it, uh, the, the credential that's needed, um, then the data can be transferred. Whatever the, the, the uh, merchant or verifier needs to know can be transferred to them and they can verify that the, the data um, came from an issuer that they trust. And I'll point at one more point uh, here. Um, this means uh, verifiers can request proofs based uh, on any verifiable credential that will give them the data that they need. And I explained earlier, governance frameworks can, uh, uh, can be used to really scale credentials to, to satisfy the needs of a large population of verifiers. Um, in addition, there's no, uh, you know, just like you have many credentials in your wallet that might help you prove uh, something like uh, your name or your address, um, uh, your, uh, uh, your employment, uh, for example. Um, there's no, nothing preventing uh, the same information from being, being issued by multiple verifiers. Uh, and, it, and it actually makes it more valuable that you have multiple proofs of certain information. So, um, and if, you, if you're asked for, uh, if a verifier does what we call a proof request for some credential or information that you don't have, what's being engineered now is a path uh, that, that the verifier is able to suggest a path or your agent working with your wallet is able to suggest how you can go get that credential and sometimes complete the whole process in, in real time and, and end out with a new credential in your wallet. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's gonna be a particularly um, a, a powerful new option for customer onboarding. Now here it happens that we have uh, uh, the, CTO for CU Ledger um, uh, uh, with us today. Um, and because my favorite example of this 
um, is the member pass credential from CU Ledger. Um, I think it's uh, going to be a wonderful example of a credential that uh, could receive very wide uh, support from verifiers because it's being designed to uh, uh, as a standardized credential of credit union membership, which means the uh, someone who's been issued that credential has gone through KYC at uh, at a credit union and it will contain a standard set of attributes that they are defining in their governance framework now. So I think it's, uh, now it's not gonna be the only credential that you know, could be used uh, widely for onboarding, but I think it's an outstanding example of that. And I inv invite uh, Daryl, if you want to add any uh, commentary to this particular example. He might not be around his uh, mute button right now. No, I, <clears throat> throw Mr. Allen, we just had a mute on. I think you've, you've captured it well. It's uh, the whole goal for member pass is to make sure that credit unions allow their members to one, have a lot better experience when they're dealing with their credit union. Because right now it's quite painful. You have to phone in especially. But also in the community, what are those other things that who cares the credit union standing, is standing behind me to say, I've been a customer for 10 years that's a very meaningful signal in business. And we're really curious to see where that part of it goes. But just the credit union friction that we can reduce is, is huge by itself. Yeah, it's a, uh, uh, and this is uh, a new branding of the credential they were working on, which I just love because I think it, uh, um, you know, really sends a strong message about proving you're a member uh, of a credit union. And, uh, um, Anyway, it's, it's, it, it, I think it's a wonderful example of this particular use case. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions yet, so we can move on to number three. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, Credential-based authorization. And uh, this is remarkably um, straightforward when you look at, at, at the problem. Um, in, in business or, or you know, everyday life, this is a very common thing that you're, you're uh, you need to access a service someplace and you need to show that you're qualified or certified um, before you can do it. Um, um, healthcare is a great example. You can only get treated by you know, certain doctors or in certain hospitals if you have coverage there. Um, but there are many, many other examples um, you know, in, you know, in, in almost every uh, uh, profession. Um, so uh, the solution, of course, is very straightforward with SSI. You, you, once you obtain the, uh, the digital version of that credential, then you can show it instantly. And um, <clears throat> this, uh, again, this authorization uh, can be provided by um, any credential that will satisfy the verifier. Now, in the case of needing a very specific credential, uh, and we'll cover an example here in a second, um, that can be specified by a governance framework that the verifier is, you know, is, is part of or subscribes to. Um, and there, there are many, th this is one of the uh, uh, biggest pain points being addressed by verifiable credentials because there is no way to do this um, online, fully digitally, um, and, and especially at the speed uh, today. So uh, I could point to uh, numerous examples. As it happens, healthcare is one of the biggest places where this pain point uh, happens. And it's true for both patients and doctors. And in fact, in the NHS uh, in, in the UK, the pain point is so big that uh, there was a, uh, a study done that uh, moving to digital credentials for doctors who are shared between hospitals and have to uh, you know, move around between hospitals with great frequency Moving to digital credentials could save 25,000 doctor days per year. That is an enormous impact, especially given you know, the stress on our medical resources that we're seeing, seeing today. So um, you can read much more about this at true.id. Um, they have recently com uh, completed a pilot, uh, uh, published out information about a pilot done with uh, uh, all of the folks listed at the bottom of the slide here. <laughs> And um, uh, they were very enthusiastic about it. So obviously there's quite a bit involved with uh, preparing an entire uh, uh, medical system to start to uh, um, accept digital credentials. 
but the early proof was there and now they're getting down to the you know to to, to the nitty gritties of um not just the software and hardware but the um the government's framework that they will need for this credential so um i could of course give a number of other examples one i like to cite at least briefly is um a, a pilot being done by uh, uh in in british columbia by the bc law society where there are um uh, legal records that you must be uh, a, 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 an attorney, a registered attorney in the uh, province of BC in order to access. And uh, the BC Law Society was looking for a solution as to how they could only provide that access. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's controlled by regulation to make sure that the access, these are legal transcripts that are only available to attorneys. And uh, a verifiable credential issued by the BC Law Society is, is the answer. So um, this is a pilot that BC Gov is undergoing right now. Um, so any questions about this? Okay, um, I see, yes, we have another one here. Um, does the verifiable credential carry the time that it was signed? Um, and is that timestamp tamper-proof? So the answer is by, uh, uh, it, by default, it is built into the verifiable credential data model to have a timestamp. Um, I believe by default it's also signed, uh, but if there was any question about that, the, uh, there is nothing to prevent the credential itself from containing an attribute or a claim as they call it of when the uh, issuer um, issued it. And, and that will be part of, of what's covered by the signature on the credential. Um, also, you didn't ask it, but um, another very common uh, um, attribute will be expiration. If a credential is only good for a certain period of time, just like real world credentials that have expiration dates, that can be an attribute on the credential. And, and it is tamper proof. Everything in the credential is digitally signed. So if you change one bit, the signature will not, um, will not verify and and this the, the verifier will reject the proof all right i'm not seeing any other questions yet and feel free we can cover everything else at the end okay I have two last use cases we want to go over um uh so number four supply chain provenance and this term verifiable origins which i want to credit to uh john jordan who uh leads the Merging uh, uh, digital uh, services team in uh, in BC, and uh, uh, this one also is exceedingly popular. I know multiple cases going on. I'm going to actually use a different example, uh, but I'll get back to uh, to John Jordan. So this is uh, whenever a supplier needs to prove the provenance of goods, um, you know, all the way up the chain to the ultimate consumer. And the SSI solution uh, has been called, I, I lo love this term, uh, creating or basically having verifiable credentials about a digital twin of that product. And uh, what's beautiful about this is this means this can apply to any product in any supply chain anywhere. Uh, not just the products that, um, you know, themselves could actually contain or, or you know, host uh, a verifiable credential internally, electronics products, uh, you know, uh, uh, devices, drones, things like that. So any product that can be tracked <coughs> by, you know, which of course they all have to be through supply chains. Um, it doesn't even have to have an RFID, uh, any kind of barcode, uh, GS1, the, the uh, international uh, standards body and infrastructure for supply chains uh, is deep into this whole, um, uh, uh, development of the, of the digital twin concept. And uh, <clears throat> so to visualize what this looks like, we'll take a supply chain here. When the product is first produced is a physical good, imagining we're talking about a physical good here, then the associated verifiable credential from that supplier attesting to its attributes is also produced and can be passed on with digitally via connection to the next supplier, just like the physical product is shipped as a good. The next supplier and it does you know, what, what, what they're doing in terms of value add, and they add a credential. And those credentials are actually chained to each other. Each one can uh, include a reference to the other credentials, so you can literally follow the links back. Um, when you get to the end of the chain, well, every supplier in, in, the, uh, in the chain can verify it, and so can the ultimate consumer of the goods or service. 
as can a regulator. Um, and regulators uh, are, are thrilled about this, this capacity. And uh, we have that on, on good uh, uh, authority from none other than uh, one of the leaders in the uh, uh, pharma space, Novartis, uh, a Swiss-based um, uh, pharma company that uh, has been uh, leading a consortia to uh, assemble verifiable supply chain for pharmaceuticals. And uh, the reason for that, uh, you've, there are many statistics out there, but the one that I, I found most alarming is World Health Organization estimates 10% of medicinal products, uh, when, when you're talking low or, or medium income uh, uh, country, are fake. And, you know, don't need to say anything more about just how dangerous that is, uh, how much, how much, it's not just a, a you know, loss of, 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 of income, it is, uh, you know, loss of life and, and the, the damage uh, to health of, of entire countries. So Novartis and his partners are very serious about this and uh, want to see a supply chains, as, as I just showed, where every um, uh, shipment of uh, uh, pharmaceutical goods would have a digital twin from inception to consumption. So uh, it's, uh, I think, quite a compelling case. Um, I'm again going to look and see if there are any questions. And if not, I will uh, briefly mention because I know actually he, he's not here today because uh, he's with his family in Europe right now. But um, this is also uh, near and dear to the uh, uh, BC team because um, what, what they're uh, striving for there is uh, verifiable origins of the energy uh, supply chain uh, for the uh, uh, oil and liquid natural gas, other ener energy uh, um, uh, uh, products produced in BC. It's their single biggest uh, uh, um, economic output. And uh, they want uh, the companies doing that want to be able to prove the origin uh, of the, the, basically the chain of atoms all the way from the wellhead to, uh, you know, your car or factory or, or house. So um, I think this is, uh, as I said, GS1 uh, is deep into this. I think this is going to be one of the broadest uses we see, even though um, it's, you know, it's largely about, um, you know, the Internet of Things or the Internet of Goods rather than uh, people and organizations. All right, let's, uh, let's cover, we're, we're almost at the end of the hour here, so I'll, I'll quickly cover the last case. Regulatory compliance, I think it's, you can probably see it from the other examples I've given, but uh, it is being uh, addressed quite directly. Whenever companies need to submit evidence that they're in compliance, um, uh, and this off, often involves, you know, reams of paperwork, but it's just today uh, based on, you know, uh, wet signatures. And um, with SSI, um, that, audit log of proofs of uh, verifiable credentials for whatever activity, whether you know, anything from supply chain to um, here, we're specifically calling out things like GDPR compliance, where uh, notice and, and consent can be digitally um, recorded, all of the proofs and then audited and uh, even have automatic, have, have uh, digital agents uh, doing real-time ongoing uh, verification that that is being done. And the example I want to cite here is, again, a presentation that was just given uh, at Hyperledger Global Forum by the team from GLIFE, the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation. If you're not familiar with LEIs, they are uh, an identifier uh, that uh, of any legal entity of any kind, any, any, any business or corporation partnership, uh, doing business in any country, any place. It's an ISO standard that was happened after the 2008 uh, financial crash. And uh, to, to simplify uh, uh, largely financial regulations worldwide, uh, but now adoption is picking up in, in many jur different jurisdictions because of the advantages of having a, uh, uh, um, a, an identifier for businesses that, that, that can cross um, uh, uh, regulatory boundaries any place in the world. And um, what they showed there was that <clears throat> what they call the Glyph chain of trust, and this is what they've already done the POCs on this, they've done one based on uh, 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 Sovereign that, uh, that uh, Evernim was uh, 
uh, helped with. They've done one based on Ethereum that uh, uh, the U4 team at Consensus um, provided the software for. So they're showing that this uh, chain of trust is uh, will work with uh, any um, uh, underlying uh, blockchain or or verifiable credential type. So the ultimate the the, the overall issuer is Glyph, a nonprofit foundation based in Switzerland, headquartered in Frankfurt. They will issue uh, verifiable credentials to um, what they call the LEI issuers or LOUs um, around the world. There are about 35 of them that are authorized to actually then issue LEIs to individual legal entities. And they will now begin issuing digital LEIs. That's what they're calling them. It's a verifiable credential of the, not just the LEI, but of the associated metadata that describes your business. It's about 20 different um, attributes um, that uh, are you know, universal for, for describing uh, a business. And the, uh, the digital LEI will have all of that together with the uh, LEI number and be signed by the issuer. And the last step is the one that uh, they, they uh, said was quite important in this presentation. And, and it is basically uh, you know, the, the last mile, which is an entity will now be able to issue um, uh, a verifiable credential um, linked to its LEI that uh, of the different roles within it, uh, a CEO, a CFO, um, a controller, um, uh, an HR um, representative, basically any official role within the company will uh, be able to have, uh, be issued uh, a verifiable credential. And uh, the associate, and, and, and in that they can publish um, a public key such that uh, the person in that role can uh, sign digital documents and show the provenance all the way back up the chain. So a regulator, for example, can have entirely um, uh, uh, you know, digital evidence signed and, and, and verify not only that you know, all of the um, uh, digital documents are, are valid under that signature, but that that signature was produced by someone uh, from the registered entity all the way back up to Glyph. So um, uh, they're, they're extremely enthusiastic about this. They, they are, uh, Glyph is, is uh, sponsored by about 60 regulators around the world. And uh, they, they showed this uh, last fall and it basically got a big thumbs up to go start and uh, turn this into infrastructure that can be, um, that the, the LEI issuers can start rolling out and they want to have that start happening in 2020 so that there are at least, I think the goal is at least three or four issuers that are issuing uh, digital LEIs in this coming year. So I'm um, checking the chat and not seeing any more questions as long as it's still current. And so um, I just say, I, I do have a, a uh, a plug here, as, as Tim said, uh, we are working or we have been working on uh, a book over more than a year now. Uh, we have over 20 contributing authors, including uh, uh, Tim, as he said, a uh, wonderful uh, chapter on uh, uh, Canada and the Pan-Canadian uh, Trust Framework and governmental uh, adoption. And uh, it's, it's going to cover a lot of these things. The early access version, uh, there's a link there uh, now, uh, you, can, you can get digital access to about half the book and we hope to have everything completed in June. You know, if Tim's done with this chapter, we should be almost, almost finished. Um, I'm pulling this leg there a little bit because there are other authors that are not quite as far along, but, um, and that's, uh, that's what I have for right now. So uh, are there any other questions? Thank you, Drummond. Um, we have a question here in the room with Daryl, so we'll just go over the, the microphone for this one. Hey, hey Drummond, I'm just hoping that Tim is still uh, still online. I have a question for him with regards to the Bank Canadian Trust Framework. Tim, are you yep. around? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Well, one of the things you mentioned, I want to make sure that uh, uh, folks heard it, and I had a question in regard to it, is that the Bank Canadian Trust Framework that you spoke of is really the public sector I was, as a naive person, call it a government profile. Um, having gone through it with many different groups, including CU Ledger, there seems to be a lot of overlap with uh, like immediate value to industry. Have you done any analysis on where the pure government, pure public sector side is and how much 
industry or commercial business can go and benefit from it? Well, we, we've, you have to understand when we developed it, uh, we had to develop this trust framework to work across different legislative contexts, different authorities, different structures, if you will, like we didn't, couldn't make any assumptions about which institutions would be carrying out which in different jurisdictions. So we, we've removed all those, what I would call limiting assumptions. So you pretty much have like a, a trust framework in its pure form. Like uh, you might say this is for the, for the, for the, for the public sector, but I would, I would say any collective, whether it's an authority like a government or a collective like, uh, like a, uh, any association, you can apply the apply these con contexts, and it's it became to us very clear like there's a super pattern here that can be applied anywhere, and it's basically that issuer holder verifier model with the with the uh, what we're starting to call the the methods below that enable you to register stuff and ensure the correctness, and that use case that pattern just maps everywhere. So so the idea is that. You know, of course, we're serving what we need for the public sector, digital identity to be recognized across uh, 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 provincial jurisdictions, also uh, possibly internationally. But there's no reason why uh, someone couldn't say, hey, we're like, a, you know, a medical college and we're going to recognize uh, uh, doctor credentials, if you will, and issue, and, and issue them. And, you know, they have their own mutual recognition framework. It just works on the same infrastructure. So, you know, what I've said, we, we've been successful in separating the institutional trust problem from the technical <laughs> trust problem. And so it, it's, yeah, it's, we've paid a lot of attention to make it as generic, generic as possible. There's no reason why someone else can't pick it up and apply it in their context. Cool. Thank you. I was going to uh, uh, say I was just I stopped sharing so I could grab the uh, uh, the shot I have of uh, that Tim's showed uh, early on. I think the uh, what he called the digital ecosystem roles and information flows um, is a uh, uh, it's a fantastic. I'll, I'll I'll share it because I've got it right here on the on the screen there. Um, uh, this diagram, and I, 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 Tim, you must have had feedback, I think, from a, a thread yeah. I was on about, about the name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I love the new name because it, it just goes exactly what well, actually corresponds perfectly to um, uh, what we call did methods uh, for yep. different types of decentralized identifiers. But I think the term works well because any method that you know, that satisfies these requirements of correctness and, uh, and can handle the registration confirmation. This, this diagram to me is the, uh, it just captures the DNA of the entire ecosystem. Yep. Um, and and uh, I love it. And there was a question earlier about, uh, I know the W3C has like a list of like 40 methods or so, but the, the, the beauty of the, the decentralized identifiers and that notion of methods is that you, in, you encapsulate what you need into that method. So if, if a nation state comes along and says, oh, we need to trust a method, they could create their own and then uh, underneath that put whatever technologies and whatever governance to make sure that method is trustworthy. And then say that you're going to issue according to that method or you're going to verify according to that method. And oh, by the way, it's going to work with all these other methods. You kind of get that stuff for free with the, with the W3 DID standard. It's incredibly powerful once you realize uh, the encapsulation there and um, what it actually gives you in terms of uh, strategic um, options. I, 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 I totally agree. And uh, um, again, as we were covering in the use cases, it, it's also true regardless of what the subject is, right? We tend yep. to think of, of course, about people and then about organizations. But uh, as you saw, a good number of the use cases I was covering, you know, the subject is uh, a good um, you know, uh, you know, it, whether it's a connected thing or or anything else of which you need to prove um, the uh, the attributes and authenticity. So, so if I can add the other thing too is it's still early days, but now we have a way of actually hedging our bets on the layer one, layer two our architectures. It could be the BTCR method, it could be the Veris one, it could be it could be like Visa, it could be Mastercard. 
Um, but now you don't have to make a strategic bet. It's basically just a configuration option. And that's, that gives you a lot of freedom and flexibility. Yes. Yes. Strongly agreed. And it, 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 it also makes it clear how at this layer that I'm, I'm, you know, in the center, that's where we need universal inter interoperability. That's where um, the, the open standards will make such a difference because once we have digital wallets that, that can accept any credential from an issuer and present it uh, approved any verifier, um, you know, then we really have interoperable um, um, trust. Uh, yep. and, 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 or, or transitive trust as Dr. Sam Smith calls it. And, and if I can add, it actually decomposes it to very two, uh, two fundamental questions. Do I trust the issuer, which is actually the governance frameworks, but then actually do I trust the methods? And there's no reason why you couldn't have an issuer, let's say issuing passports to say, you're gonna issue it using the government method, Government of Canada, but there's no reason why you couldn't issue it to Visa, MasterCard or Bitcoin. Does, and you could, have, you could have them all work. Yes. That's yeah. the beauty of it. Yeah. Again, that's why it's just, it's, uh, Tim has a real uh, talent for boiling these things down to their essence. Uh, and this, I think, is one of my very favorite diagrams. Yeah. Uh, at, at, like we've ran this through, like my, my co-author, Dave Roberts and I, we, we, we always joke that we, we test it with medieval implement, implementations of things like uh, Marco Polo presenting his credentials to Kublai, Kublai Khan. What are the methods? It's the parchment and it's the wax and the, you know, the holes in the paper and how it's written. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, the same, it's the same thing. The technology is different now, but um, those use cases work as well. So once you start thinking about it abstractly like that, and realize you can remove a lot of what I call limiting assumptions from your architecture. And then the, the power of your solution just becomes exponential once you remove those limiting assumptions. And I'm, I'm really excited. Totally agree. Excellent. Any other, uh, any other questions? Oh, here's uh, John Wonderlich just added another question. Is there a mapping between this nomenclature and federated um, um, uh, architectures and their terms, IDP, relying party, et cetera, yeah. to explain to traditional identity people. You want to answer that, Tim? Sure. Um, John, if you get the version 1.1 off GitHub, we've actually uh, started to do that. We had quite a, and if you listen to the podcast too, you'll discover when we were defining like stakeholders and roles, and we had all these, you know, different definitions. I, you know, authoritative parties, relying parties, service providers. So it was a bit of a dog's breakfast. And when we um, really uh, drilled down on this model here of the issuer holder, verifier, subject and methods, we found we could map everything cl cleanly into this model. So um, we basically threw out what we had before with the federated and centralized models. Not, not to say that they weren't valid, but we found that we could map everything to the, these constructs here. And that's basically how we how we how we how we how we tested it out. So it's there, and if you throw like a traditional term at me, I could probably map it in here uh, quite easily. Uh, another point I want to make on this diagram: you'll see that there's no line between subject and holder. That was very purposeful, because while uh, one might assume that the subject is the holder controlling the private keys, that may not necessarily be the case. You could be someone acting uh, on behalf of uh, like another person, a guardian. It, 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 a subject could be anything. It could be a land title, it could be anything. And um, the, the model allows for, the model's generic enough to allow for those other broader use cases like relationships. And even those ones that uh, Drummond was describing earlier that like a holder may have to say that they're a doctor, for example, that's a claim. And a, again, we don't have that direct line because you traverse that via the the other the dotted and um, uh, solid lines. So um, I, I just want to make that point too. That is a very good point. I remember that came up in the discussion. And I um, the fact that uh, the holder and the subject can be separate. Of course, like we said, everything that's IoT or or non-human that's going to be the case. Yep. Um, but it's also the case uh, anytime you have uh, an organization, the organization, uh, well, technically the organization could hold the wallet, but ultimately it's going to be an individual that's acting on behalf of that organization. So that 
that ability for them to be the same, you know, when it's a, a common case, for instance, of a, of a person that's actually um, um, SSI enabled, um, is is obviously important. But the case where they're where they're not is going to be very prevalent as well. Okay, wait, I saw one, one more question came on. If there's still time, could you please talk a bit about existing products on the market, uh, such as Uport, um, ShowCard, and SecureKey? Um, I'm happy to take uh, Uport. I'm not up to date on ShowCard, uh, and, and, and Tim, you're probably closer uh, uh, to SecureKey. Sure. Uh, so Uport um, is the... Um, um, uh, the team or what they call the spoke inside consensus, uh, the company that uh, is best known for the Ethereum uh, ecosystem. Uh, Uport is the, is the uh, self-sovereign identity team within that that has been working on um, a wallet and agent for, uh, that works with the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, Uport has been a contributor to the open standards that we're talking about. Um, they are, uh, you know, very active in the space. They're now actually involved in, in some of the Hyperledger projects. So we're trying to um, uh, bridge the, uh, um, there is, uh, again, I, I mentioned earlier, several um, DID methods for Ethereum. And uh, uh, I think Ethereum, you know, fits those methods will fit nicely in this diagram as, um, you know, a way to, uh, to, to verify uh, the correctness of uh, uh, verifiable credentials issued to DIDs in the Ethereum ecosystem. So um, they have, you know, uh, they are also active at the Decentralized Identity Foundation, uh, where they're working on uh, interop projects that involve many of us. So, um, I, you know, I think they're... Uh, uh, you know, one of, one of the options uh, for that that's working again towards this model that you're seeing on your screen. Um, show card, I I have not been up to speed. Uh, Tim, do you have any more recent information on show card? So the market is experiencing a Cambrian explosion. It's an early stage market. So you got lots of vendors out there making lots of claims and being from the government point of view, one of the primary motivations of a diagram like this, it gives us a tool to categorize these vendors and plug them in different spots and say, yes, we're interested in this piece from you. This other piece we don't really care about. Um, you always fall in the trap, especially in early stage markets where a vendor will try to oversell what they have. And, and, and that's all good intentions. Like I used to be on the other side. I know exactly what the strategies are to, to, to get a, a client locked in for quote unquote value add services. So this really gives us a tool to um, really take, you know, if I, if I knew anything about short card, it would probably take me about 10, 15 minutes worth of analysis to say, that's, that's the key thing there. And uh, show card, does this and they should work with that and we'll just make that a condition for an RFP, um, that's it. So that's really um, really what this tool, tool uh, enables. So for example, when someone talks about digital wallets, I basically look at this diagram and say, well, digital wallets is that, it's that agent thing, but it really starts going around the notion of holders and methods and, and, and issuers can provision into that wallet and that wallet can present proofs. That's, that's the, uh, the, the bucket that a digital wallet fits in. And then immediately you start saying, well, that digital wallet should be able to accept anything from any issuer and actually present proofs to any verifiers or a selected subset that we uh, command. And if there's any proprietary limitations, whether it's on purpose or not, we can be pretty unequivocal what our requirements are. So this, that gives us, gives us a tool. Same with like, you know, someone make claim that they have the best crypto in the world or whatnot. It's like, well, that's where the correctness part comes in. We'll say, well, we may have to uh, drill down on the elliptic curves, the, the, the implementations, and we can get our like security agencies involved to make sure we've got like the high integrity um, that we know that those algorithms work. Make, they're already published anyway, but there are other ones as well. But then also, you know, other other things like secure enclaves, so on and so forth. We can actually kind of uh, really uh, compartmentalize uh, the requirements and focus the analysis instead of being sold something that is trying to do more than what it's supposed to do. And that's you know just having that experience. Um, we are really committed, and again, this is me speaking, but 
committed to have an open and interoperable um, uh, ecosystem and let the let the markets sort this out like we don't know which methods are going to going to going to prevail like as, as Drummond said there's that power curve like who, who knows what's going to play out um, we want to issuers have as many options as possible and verifiers have as many options as possible and I say most importantly we want to have the broad broadest set of subjects uh, um, enabled by this whether it be individuals organizations or land titles or cryptocurrency fits in this model as well really just uh, by getting ahead of the curve and defining this ecosystem in an unequivocal way it just gives us huge leverage in making sure that we get solutions that serve our needs in the long run yeah i i, I would tr double triple down on what tim just said because uh this model um is uh it is universal enough to actually give us uh, uh the long sought trust layer for uh for the internet and uh uh, as, as Tim knows, we're working on, on uh, standardizing the whole stack necessary to implement exactly what uh, you see here, this model, uh, four layer stack, we call the trust over IP model. And, and that's exactly the goal to say, hey, we can now standardize how trust happens between any two entities on yep. the internet, the same way the TCP IP stack standardized yep. uh, in a packet exchange. So that is a, um, it, it's hard to put you know, a uh, 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 bright enough spotlight on just how big an opportunity that is for trust on the internet. And, uh, and that's why you've got folks like Tim and I, you know, doing the uh, digital equivalent of jumping up and down and saying, all yep. right, we're, we're really getting there. Yep, so, exactly. Yeah. Wonderful. I um, just, we have a few minutes left. I think we have one last question from uh, the room here and then we will wrap it up. Hi, Tim. This is Rakesh Kohal, and I have a question regarding PCTF framework. Uh, yep. As I see, uh, the PCTF framework uh, constrains the scopes to the personal and organizational identity. Uh, but going back to what Drummond was saying, that uh, there are some IoT-based devices or there's yep. something called ethical AI is coming up, right? So there are bots. Uh, there are adv ro robo advisors yep. and all, all those kinds of implementations which are coming up. And those, those implementations also have, they can keep the keys and they can sign the transactions or send the information over the network. So is there any reason for keeping those uh, uh, particular uh, subjects out, out of the scopes in the PCTF framework? So we, we have been very careful in our definitions Mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, we have to be focused. If you try to do too much, you, then you end up doing nothing. So we focus on individuals and organizations, but you will see um, that there is this more generalized um, definition called a digital representation, which is an electronic representation of any entity that can be subject to legislation, policy, or regulations. So that could be an IoT device, it could be a AI robo agent or whatever. We're just we're just not there yet, but we 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 know that's on the radar screen. Um, there, in addition to persons and organizations, there's IoT devices. One could argue that th those are just agents of principles anyway. But then you have uh, uh, cryptocurrency, you have tokens, you have claims uh, that that can easily be grafted onto the model without um, doing a full scale renovation of the concept. So. Uh, you know, we have a lot of experience in making sure that we are very careful in crafting our definitions. Uh, and if you go to the latest version of the PCTF and go to the terminology, we've been very careful to generalize those definitions so that if someone comes along and says, oh, we need to apply this to AI or I IoT, um, we'll say we'll start off with this and work it through from there. But the the, the focus has been on digital identity of persons and organizations, but you know, this model that you see before you, it can be applied to anything. And it's just a matter of time and focus before those things get ingested into the model. I, I strongly agree with Tim. I like to uh, point out that, you know, when you look at this model and, uh, but in these, in these three boxes here, you, you, you see a digital agents working, uh, you know, to represent, to issue the credentials, to accept, hold the credentials, protect the proofs, to request the proofs and process the proofs. 
um, then it becomes almost obvious where you can add AI um, uh, to assist in all three of those roles, right? Um, and and I like to also point out these roles are are universal. It's a little bit like you talk about email. Well, are we senders of email? Are we receivers of email? Are we storers of email? Of course, we all do all of that all the time. Um, the same thing is true of this trust infrastructure. Uh, it, it might sound, oh, how many people were going to issue credentials? But um, as we move out into the, the point, there will be you know, micro-credentials and people will, will, in fact, be issuing all the time. Um, so the, uh, what, the way I like to put it is you, you, can, you can plug a, AI in uh, to the agent role any place along that. But um, I've had folks, including one person that... Uh, uh, Hyperledger Global Forum last week just say the data in those verifiable credentials and in the verified relationships and connections that are being set up here, because it is uh, you know cryptographically verifiable and represents those trust relationships, it has tremendous value. It's not like the other data that many AI systems are being fed. It is the best. It's you know it's it's uh, I'd say you know it's. 10 to 100 times more valuable information. And so I think it will actually become a, you know, uh, as much of a infrastructure for uh, the advancement of AI as it is for the rest of the problems we'll be solving. Yeah, and, and I just want to add this model actually clarifies some things that are often conflated. Um, you can add counterparties on either side of this. So relying party and uh, someone that's an authoritative party. And then the, the, the verifier might end up being a black box that that uh, counterparty uses, and there's some there's there's trust in there. So, you know, we we'll save that for a later time. But there there's some Im implications, and that's one thing when we developed this model, we made no assumptions about the asymmetry of the parties, which is viewed them as counterparties: government, individual, individual government authority, uh, someone that's a user. This model makes no distinction on the status of those counter counterparties. So, you know, that might be worth for another um, uh, uh, seminar, but uh, uh, it, it really uh, enables some new th new thinking about how you're going to build out an infrastructure and where, where are you going to invest your trust, actually. Awesome. Thank you so much, gentlemen. We really appreciate both your times. Uh, Drummond and Tim, this has been Fantastic. I hope everyone online here got a lot of value out of this conversation today. Um, again, I think all, all of this is, it only works uh, as long as people are collaborating and there's communities around these types of things. We're really in foundational stages right now and there's tons of pipes that need to be laid before use cases are able to flourish, but we really appreciate uh, all the work that the community is doing and a lot of the stuff uh, Tim is doing with the government uh, and outside of that, and then what Drummond is doing with Evernim and other projects. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. If uh, folks are looking to learn more about future events, we're looking to continue these things on a monthly basis. So we have a meetup page, so please feel free to go there and uh, register for our meetup group, Self Sovereign Identity Toronto, and stay up to date when we announce our next event. Uh, and you could always find more information about this through Northern Block social accounts. We'll be posting a lot about this in the upcoming days and uh, hopefully posting the, the next event date in the upcoming days as well. So uh, once again, thank you everyone and uh, have a great evening all.